Hi everybody! Welcome to another month of Wild Sun Catcher. For the month of October, we're going to be celebrating and learning about and doing crafts with the cranberry. Its scientific name is Vaccinium macrocarbon. <clears throat> Today, I am going to be showing you how to make a natural dye from the cranberry um, so that you can dye some muslin or whatever type of cloth, cotton or something that you have at your house. Um, we will also be providing a kit. So if you haven't had a chance to register, we have a few left. Um, and in that kit will be provided a white piece of muslin um, along with some other craft supplies for some projects for the cranberries. So in order to make the dye, um, it's kind of a two-step process if you choose to mordant, to add a mordant to your cloth to help with the color fastness um, after the cloth has dried. Otherwise, you can make it a more of a one-step process and just dip your cloth in the dye, in the cranberry dye itself. If you choose to go with the mordant, what you're going to do is heat up a pot of water until you have warmish water, not boiling. You're going to add um, two tablespoons of alum. And alum you can find at most grocery stores. You want it to be a kitchen safe. Um, or a food safe alum, because if you're using a kitchen pot, it just makes it safer. There are a lot of mordants out there that are pretty intense chemicals, and we decided to stay away from those. Um, they're, they're much harder to deal with. So two tablespoons of alum you can put into your pot, and then you're also gonna want one tablespoon of cream of tartar. And the two of those mixing together um, creates a solution that will help hold the color in your cloth. So once you mix those um, into your water, you're going to turn, turn it up until there's a simmer. Add your cloth and let it simmer for about 20 minutes. Then you're going to turn the heat off and take your pot off the heat and you can let it sit and soak actually overnight or for about like five hours throughout the day. Once it's cooled down and you've let it sit and soak for a long time, you can take the cloth out, um, rinse it off and then wash your pot really well. So that's kind of the first step. And then you have this kind of damp um, cloth that you've put the mordant into. Second step is to make the dye with the cranberries. And you can purchase cranberries at the grocery store or you can go out and forage for some wild cranberries in the bogs around here. Um, they're, they're still out and about in some places. You're going to um, put cranberries in your pot, take them out of the bag, of course, <laughs> um, and then just cover them with water. And the more water you add, the probably lighter pink the solution will be. And um, the less water you add, the darker red it will be. But um, you definitely want to put some water in so it doesn't burn the cranberries on the bottom of the pot. Then you're going to bring that, um, the cranberries in the water to a boil and let it simmer uh, and then turn it down to simmer and let it simmer for about half an hour. And then you, you can put your mordant and cloth into that dye. Um, and I let it sit in the dye on really low heat, just kind of barely simmering for about an hour. Um, and it made, as you can see, this kind of light pink. If you were to keep it in the solution, in the dye overnight, off of the heat, of course, um, you might get a darker color. You can kind of experiment a little bit. Another option um, that mine didn't work out very well, but um, I'm gonna show you anyway, you can kind of make like a tie-dyed, um, version of this project and to do that you would before you put your cloth in the dye you take your white cloth and probably many of you have done this before for maybe silk dyeing or tie dye and kind of roll it up and there are all sorts of versions you can look them up online um, and then just wrap rubber bands around them as tight as possible um, to like make a pattern and then you'd stick that right in your dye pot after your cloth has sat in the pot for as long as um, you would like and, and as long as the color starts to look like it's holding in the cloth, you can take it out and just hang it on a clothesline and dry it. And that's basically all you have to do. And you get this beautiful pink cloth that you can use for whatever you like. Um, oh, actually I missed one step. So go back to the cranberries in the pot. Um, you probably wanna strain the cranberries out so that you don't have bunches of cranberry pulp all over your cloth. So this is um, the juice after I've strained it. And to strain it, you can use anything from a cheesecloth 
to an old pillowcase, if that's what you have at your house, um, or something like this. And that just uh, makes it easier for when you take your cloth out so it's not all covered in pulp. All right, I think that is all. If you would like to share what you end up making with Claire and I, you can find our emails at the end of this video. And thank you so much for listening. Hi, I'm Kip, and this is my cranberry bog. Mia and my sister Dale, who you probably know from the library, she works at the circulation desk. We take care of these couple of bogs, and they were built quite a while ago, like 20 years ago, but then haven't been taken care of as much the last little while, so we're slowly bringing them back. Um, maybe we should get to know what cranberry plants look like first, and then we can traipse around and explore what else lives around them and with them. So the cranberries um, grow low, low, low to the ground like this. Um, on these long runners. They're really closely related to blueberries. So when you see blueberry plants, they grow up and are more woody and bushy, but these ones grow in these long, flexible vines that they send out over the bog. And then every so often, they send up these little upright pieces. And these are the ones that flower in the early summer. And then they hold the berries like this one plant with berry <laughs> um, so they they grow are really like blueberries but they grow in a super different spot so this, we're calling this a cranberry bog even though I'm standing here and it's totally dry and you would be able to walk here without your boots on right now um, but cranberries live here in the wild Maybe you've found them if you've gone exploring or seen them near trails or out in the wild bogs. And they are really short, as we can see. And so all these other plants really easily grow over them and shade them out. But in bogs, a lot of plants don't do that well. But cranberries have adapted to be able to live where it's really wet without essentially drowning like some plants do. They can still get enough oxygen and they can get enough nutrients out of soil even when there's not a lot available. And so they can grow in this kind of hard place to live and do it without having to compete for sunlight with all the other taller plants. This bog, they don't have to compete as much because we're actually working to cut things down and remove weeds and things. You can see that's not entirely true at the moment, but we're working on it. It'll get better all the time. Um, so. They are growing in this super unique place. And if you go out and look in wild bogs, you can often find them. Now, sometimes you aren't gonna see the berries, but you can still see the plants. And you can tell they're cranberries because they have these long runners and then they have leaves that go on opposite sides. So not in pairs, so that's called opposite leaves. These are alternate leaves, like one on each side, sort of in a zigzag pattern. And I don't know if the camera can see it, but you can see that one of them you're seeing the back side, and then one of them you're seeing the front side, and then you're seeing the back side again. You have these small oval leaves. And then when it gets to the upright parts, they grow sort of like that, but more on all sides of it. So it's a little bushier and you can see that. And then they take on like in the fall and the winter, just like the blueberries, they have these great red colors on all the leaves and everything too. Um, in the early summer, the flowers don't look anything at all like blueberry flowers, like because the blueberry flowers are those little bells. Whereas these ones, so the story I've heard is that they're called cranberries because that's the way we've now said it, but they used to be called craneberries because the flowers look like little crane beaks. And so they've got like this long sort of sticky out part and then the petals reflex back and it looks like a crane's bill is what the story is anyway. Um, but so there are these little pink flowers and if you come out here when it's really flowering well, then it's like a little pink fog across the whole bog. This is our bog mascot, Grendel, who comes and helps when we're not picking. 
because if we bring her when she's poor picking, she eats too many. Um, <laughs> which is not so great for us, for the business. But this year, there aren't that many cranberries to pick. We've had a really poor crop, and so Grendel is participating. Hey, yeah. um, and we think that there were not so many berries for a bunch of reasons. One is that we've had this super big drought this year. Everybody's probably seen how dry it is, and there's less water in the ponds. And like this is not just like not that soggy, it's really dry this year. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> this is very tough for us. Uh, yeah, so there's been the drought, which didn't let the berries set very well. And then early this spring, there were some big late spring frosts. And we think those might have hurt the flowering buds a little bit. We think that they may have had some pressure from when we had that hot and humid weather back in August where it was so, so, so sticky. Um, but that lets a lot of diseases that live in the cranberries affect the fruit more. Um, even though you don't see them until this time of year, what it does is eventually when the fruit set, rather than getting like the nice red berries, we end up like with these orange berries, which are still beautiful, but they're soft and they don't keep as well. And we aren't gonna sell them to you or let you cut or encourage you to come pick them because they won't last and they taste a little different. Grendel still likes them, but most people don't. <laughs> the other interesting thing about cranberries is that like blueberries, these aren't something that we have to come out and plant every year. So we have this cranberry farm, but we aren't coming out and like digging up all the soil and planting new cranberry seeds every year. These just live here and grow here and stay permanently. So it's more us just tending the same plants and encouraging them from year to year rather than planting new ones. Um, and that means that the other things that can grow here can be different too because we aren't turning it all over we aren't taking everything out um, we're just letting things grow and so we end up with all sorts of other animals and plants that grow here too you can see some of the weeds we have right they aren't just grass and things like that growing in among other vegetables it's like bayberry and alder trees and these ones are all short because we cut them this last winter this is just what grew this year um, but we'll keep cutting them down until they don't have as much energy to compete and grow really tall over the cranberries. So we've got all these different things doing it. And when Dale and I are out raking cranberries, often we have to work really hard not to scoop up toads and snakes. And last year we had tons and tons and tons of praying mantises and all sorts of praying mantis egg cases. And we had to work really hard <laughs> to avoid getting them all in the bins of cranberries because we really wanted them to stay in the bog. Um, in the winter time, you come down and you can see where the coyotes have dug through the snow to eat the cranberries and the deer come through and dig down. You can see where rabbits have eaten some, but actually we think it's the dogs and the coyotes that seem to like them the most. That's who we see the most sign of. So when Dale and I are picking the cranberries, you can go out and you can pick them by hand and that's what you might do if you're finding them like when you're ice skating in the bogs or on the creeks or anything. Um, but what we're doing mostly is we're using these little rakes. They're like blueberry rakes, but the tines are further apart because the cranberries are a little bit bigger. Um, and then we're doing just like with cranberries. You sort of have to channel all your inner clam digger. Um, leaning over and you try to be really careful with your back. Sometimes Dale and I kneel a bit to do it and you're just dipping into the tops of the vines and grabbing them up like that. You're trying not to pull up too many vines because that's not fun if you know you're hurting your plant. Um, and you just keep dipping into the top really gently and they all get caught by the teeth and pulled through. So these get sweeter if they get frozen. So if you're gonna pick your own just to eat. I like getting them in the winter after they've had a chance to freeze a little bit 
because then they're like little sweet tart gushers that you sort of pop in your mouth. Um, so when we get the pan full, and this is not very full because there aren't very many berries this year, um, we dump them in to a fish box like this. Some people use blueberry boxes, but Dale and I actually, our family, what we actually do for a living as well as farming cranberries is mostly fishing. And so we're really familiar with these. And so we use them because we've got them <laughs> and we know how to use them really well. So we fill them up. And then once we have a full, full bin, we take them up and we bring them to our sorting machine, which we'll make sure to show you too. So this is an older part of the bog that never got weeded or trimmed. And so you can see, we don't just have cranberry plants. We have in fact, trees growing in the bog. And we actually think that the vines kind of like it. A lot of the cranberry vines are super happy and healthy down in this portion of the bog. Um, and we're not sure whether because getting a little bit of shade helps them. They might not set as much fruit, but the vines might not lose as much water. So in a dry year like this one, they might be able to keep water. And sometimes also like trees with their big deep roots, they're actually like bringing up all sorts of nutrients and water from down below where like smaller plant roots can't necessarily get to, but they're bringing it up to the surface and they're either releasing it as like little roots die and then regrow or they've got the leaves and then they drop down and are making releasing those things back into the soil as well so we're not sure what it is that the cranberries like about it but we're trying to learn and so we're spending these couple of years watching it a lot and we talk to a lot of people who know more than we do and then yeah we'll keep an eye on it we're gonna let the tree keep these keep going for right now what we aren't going to keep growing though is over here we have this jungle of what's called Phragmites, which isn't native to here but grows all over the world and it's also called water reed. So this is the big grass that they use for thatched roofs like in England. So if any of you guys wants to thatch a roof, you should totally come look us up because we have plenty. In fact, we're going to try, Claire's going to try for you guys to push the camera through so that you can see just how much and just how jungle-like it gets. But just know, as we're walking, the cranberry vine on the bottom is growing there the whole time. There aren't many berries, but the plants are there and happy. Brendel and I will leave the way. water here to use for irrigating the cranberries when it's dry or sometimes you use water in the sprinkler system to also like spray them on really cold nights when you're trying to protect them from frost because the water keeps them from freezing as much. Um, now it's been a really droughty year and you guys have probably seen other places that are dry but this is where the water level is now and then it goes all the way up this barren bank and the water should be like up here. And you can see all the cattails are getting brown and drying out this year. And so we're trying to be very careful about how we use water. So we have this reservoir up here. So it's this pond that there are springs from the ground that bubble up into this reservoir, which is why there's as much water as this even with it being this much drought this year. Um, and then we can do two things. One is we can open a culvert that goes underneath that bank behind me. And we can open it up and it flows down into the bog, which is lower down. And so it just goes by gravity um, into the bog where it grows. The other thing we can do is we can use a pump and put it through a pipe that goes up and over that bank and then down into pipes underneath the bog. 
and then that comes back up in all bun a bunch of sprinklers that are spaced out through the bog and so we can water them or use it to keep them from getting frozen when we're trying to do that. Um, and then there's another culvert at the other side of the bog and that goes down into a lower pond, so another reservoir where we can hold water. And that way, if we think this one's getting too low, we can either pump water out of this one to use for the bogs, or we're working on a system too where we can pump it back up from this one, back up the hill to this one where we can start to use it all over again. Um, and that also means that if we do things like fertilize the soil, and we're growing ours organically, so we're only using certain things, but we sometimes use like seaweed or fish fertilizer to help the plants stay healthy. Um, but it means that we can catch all of that, anything that didn't get caught up and sucked up through the plants, um, we can catch that at the lower end and it settle and reuse it rather than having it just go anywhere out into other streams and into the ocean too. Um, so that's how we're trying to use water as efficiently as possible because especially in this year, years like this one, we don't want to be using any more than we have to. So when we get the berries, out of the bog and we sort them all out and get all the leaves and the vines winnowed out and they sort them from the soft berries that we can use or we can freeze or use for like cranberry sauce but we don't want to sell to people who might want them to keep a little bit better in their fridge. Um, we pack them to get in the shed and so what we do is we scoop them up in our boxes and we fill them up and this is the way we sell them. Sometimes people sell them in bags, sometimes we do that too. But we've been selling them these nice little berry boxes and then we put our label on, which was printed by your favorite kids librarian, Claire, for us. She made it and then we sell them just like that so that people can pick them up in the store. Um, which is kind of exciting, by the way, if you grow things and then you see the things you grow actually being sold in a store, it's kind of a neat feeling. And we think that the berries look beautiful in the boxes like this. Um, and they're one of the things that we, we don't always think of as fruit. And so we wanted to find a way to make sure that when we see them or when you see them, in your kitchen or places like that, you're thinking of them like other fruits and how you might use them, like sprinkled in your oatmeal or in your desserts or things like that, because cranberries are pretty tart. Um, and so we use them a little bit differently than we do other things, more like we would rhubarb in places where we use a lot of sugar. Um, but we think that they are pretty delicious in other places too, and so we're trying to to sell them to folks and show them in a way that makes other people think of interesting ways to use them too. Hi everyone, welcome back to Wild Sun Catchers. I'm Claire, the Youth Services Librarian at the Blue Hill Library, and this month we are talking about cranberries. So, I am going to be demonstrating how to make cranberry prints. So what you're going to need are some cranberries, paper, and either a pad of ink or a paint and paintbrushes. And if you've got one of the little craft kits, you'll have one of these little ink pads. And so that's what I'll be demonstrating with today. And you'll also need a knife and a cutting board to cut your cranberries in half. So once you have a cranberry, you're going to cut it this way. And when you open it up, it has um, really cool air pockets that have interesting designs. So we are going to get started. Okay, so once you have your cranberry cut in half, you'll notice that there are these little air pockets inside that make um, really cool designs. So you are going to take your cranberry half and either paint it with a paintbrush or dip it on an ink pad. And then once it's a little bit darkened, then you press it to a piece of paper. And one cool thing about it is that some of the juice from the cranberry ends up being on the page as well. So you get this um, nice little pink outline that goes along with it. 
and I think it's really fun to do as a pattern so I do lots and lots of them and you could make these as cards you could do this on the piece of fabric that you dyed that Lander showed you how to do um, so this is what it ends up looking like so I hope you have a good time and make lots of prints Thank you for joining us this month for Wild Sun Catchers, and I hope that you'll join us for November and find out what our plant of the month will be then. Take good care. <laughs>